My name is Aaron McManus, and you're listening to the Battle Ready Podcast. I'm here with my dad, Earl McManus, and a special guest, Joe Smith. Mm. Pastor Joe Smith from Mosaic here. So good to have you. It is so good to be here. Man, it's an honor. Thank you, guys. At one point, your Instagram handle was Joe Smith. It was. Like yeah. a Smurf, but Smith. <laughs> Just trying to keep <laughs> Like back in the day, wasn't it? Yeah, for, for a long time. It was That was before you had self-respect. <laughs> it's why. That's it why. was back when Instagram was more like an AOL instant messenger thing. <laughs> 100%. And I realized if I'm going to be an adult, I need to drop the Fs <laughs> and I need to add the TH. And yeah. how old you were you when you decided to become an adult? Maybe Joe? 33. 33. <laughs> All right. 33. Yeah. That's and pretty good for your And your <laughs> full name is Joseph Smith. It is indeed. No connection to... No, no, you're, the, found, you're the founder of the uh, Mormon church. Or... <laughs> yeah, in my spare time, I do form religions and invest in a small little did, state called Utah. Did uh, you watch Murder Among the Mormons? I haven't yet, oh. but I, I saw the trailer and and I was like, yeah, that's my people. You know? <laughs> that's your people. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. I don't think your people allowed your people in for they, a long time. They did not. There was an issue. And as a black man forming a world religion that doesn't really... Can like this, your kind. Now, some listen to Battle Ready and some watch Battle Ready. Yes. So if you're listening to Battle Ready and you're not familiar with Joe Smith, he is a black man. <laughs> <laughs> I know the name doesn't lend itself, but it's hilarious. In my family, there's yes. Jamal, there's a Ramonte, Denisha, Denier, and then Joe. <laughs> Joe. <laughs> What's your brother's name? Jamal. Yeah. Jamal. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And, and then they were like Joseph. Yeah, because I my mom let her sister name me because she passed out on the delivery table. <laughs> and and uh, her boyfriend at the time was named Joseph. So like okay. that's the deep meaning. So you behind got named after someone's yeah, boyfriend. boyfriend? <laughs> yeah, my mom's sister's boyfriend. Yeah, that, that's that's a little cold. Yeah, I love <laughs> your mom. I I appreciate you, but I would have loved a little more flair than that's Joe. Like yeah. saying, I, my mom met a man on the subway and let his girlfriend meet you or something. I don't know. That sounds kind of interesting. That is interesting. But all right, well, it's good to have you. Uh, it's and good to be here. I'm glad they gave you such an unusual name. <laughs> yes. And uh, I don't think I've ever known another Joe Smith. And if you look right. in the in the phone book, you remember the old phone books? You probably are the only Joe Smith in For the whole sure. country. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we're glad to have you. Mm, thank and you. It's gonna, we have some fun. It's going to be I'm excited. Good. I'm excited. Me we too. figured this out. We figured we invited you on to be a guest last night yep. when we were hanging out watching. Uh, supposedly, it was the All Star Game. That's what they called it. But <laughs> it, it, it felt a lot like a. Like a like a B A like a B team AAU tournament. Yeah, it, it was terrible. It felt a little bit like when we play ball sometimes, you know. <laughs> Except Joe, when we play ball, we're not dunking. Yeah. Right? We're not dunking. <laughs> true, true, this is very true. true. Yeah. They played our defense, <laughs> but we do not play their offense. <laughs> that is accurate. Like, let me just be really honest with our audience because we're really committed to integrity. <laughs> yes, it, 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 our game looks nothing like that. Yes, but. Which is terrible to think. But of. that worst game, game. looks nothing <laughs> yeah. like their actual. It yeah. was pretty bad, right? It was really bad. The yeah. dunk contest was the low light of the, of the. All-Star yeah, I, I read a headline that <laughs> the guy who won, who yeah. seems like an awesome he kid, seems great. Yeah, yeah. Anthony uh, Simons. Yeah. The headline was he won the contest by nearly kissing, kissing the, rim. the rim. I was and like, he oh, wasn't that's not that a... close. <laughs> no. But I don't no. want him to get closer because he could have lost all his teeth. Yes. And which would have been unwise. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm not worth the trophy. But it wasn't. Yeah, it, yeah. it wasn't it's spectacular. Fine. It was not. No, no. So I can't dunk. So they were doing something I can't do. Right. But none of the guys who had won the other dunk contests seemed very interested in it. No, you oh. can even tell by the scores they they yeah. were very uh, diplomatic in their yeah. answers, yeah. Uh, yeah. knowing that this was not the highest quality dunk contest ever. Yeah, you can't compare. I, I wouldn't compare that to what I can do because I don't compare greatness to me because then mm. it's then everything looks great. Yeah. yeah. They, they, they were all great in comparison to me. But when you compare them to great dunkers in the past, yeah. great athletes in the past, it seemed um, incredibly pedestrian, mm. um, incredibly average. Yeah. It, it felt like you could almost pull any guard or, or forward in the NBA and they could have done something very similar. Mm. So... Do you think COVID had something to do with that quarantine? What do you what, what, what do you think caused that? Joe? I do, yeah, because you can even feel the energy in the room was lacking. And the All Star game, that's the biggest thing, because you have all these guys that they have three days away, yeah. and they don't they see each other for a game maybe during the season, mm-hmm. yeah. but they actually get to come together. The, the electricity in the arena with the yeah. fans and the slam dunk contest was an event. 
that mm-hmm. everyone would talk about for you. And they put it in the middle of the game at halftime. It just seemed. And it was a dud. And, yeah. and I think, yeah, we, it was a byproduct of what we're all dealing with right now. And everything feels like with COVID, it's just there's a lack with a lot of things that we've come to expect excellence in. So do you think across the board, and I don't mean just in basketball, I mean across the nation now, I'm kind of applying this to all of us as listeners. Sure. Do you feel like the ceiling has been lowered of what we expect from each other mm. and uh, of what the measure of greatness is right now? Mm. I do, because even with the All-Star game, like we mm-hmm. were talking about the MVP, that Giannis of the actual game, uh, I'm not going to try his last name, uh, but we'll call him Giannis, he won the MVP. Which I thought was really disappointing. Yeah, and his stat line looked amazing. 16 for 16, yeah, 35 16 points. Dunks. Exactly. He didn't have an impact. Like I, <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm sorry, 13 dunks, three <laughs> accidental three-pointers. For sure. But that was what was <laughs> rewarded as like the most valuable player. Yeah. When it wasn't, when you watch the game, it was Steph and Dame had the greatest impact. And I think those guys are having the greatest impact on their teams. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like during the season. And yeah. I, I agree. To, so much of what you said is accurate. Mm-hmm. I think that how we're defining greatness is being shifted mm-hmm. um, and that we don't actually know what true greatness looks like right now. Because the the marker has been shifted so much. Yeah. Who do we think is going to win the MVP of the league this year? I think it's going to be LeBron. Hmm. But but I do think that's somewhat political. Sure. And yeah. it, I, it I mean one he he has missed it in years when he should have received it. Right. There's no question. Yeah, it's true. You, yeah. you know that there have been other years where he should have been the MVP. In that way, he like kind of the last three years probably. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. yeah, he's he has the Jordan syndrome where. Jordan was just the best every year. Yeah, they, they get bored of voting for him. Yeah, I think yeah, they gave yeah. it to Carl Malone one year, when instead of Jordan, instead yeah. of Jordan, yeah. and and I have an autographed basketball by Carl Malone, so I'm not diminishing his greatness. Right. And uh, when I met him, he was a really kind, really gracious he, person. It doesn't mean he was the best. That but year, though. I don't think I'm anyone glad you have who, a personal relationship with Carl Malone. No, I'm just <laughs> saying I don't think anyone could objectively say Carl Malone was better that year or any year. Yeah, absolutely. Than Michael Jordan. Yeah, if he was better, he would have won a championship. Well, Yikes. they. I mean, they had. Some now talent. you're being shocked to Barkley. I, I, did, I read. I read a stat line that said if John Stockton, who was for all your all the non basketball players, basketball or basketball interested people that listen are listening to this, hang with us because I, it's yes, going to matter. We're getting. We're getting. There, we're getting there. That I read a stat line that said John Stockton, who was is the highest mm-hmm. leading assists maker yeah. in in the league or mm-hmm. history of NBA, he was on the same team as Carmelo. Mm-hmm. He could have not played his last six seasons and still been number one on the all-time assist. Yeah, and I, I, I got to be honest. How crazy is that? That's crazy. And yeah. I, I'm not sure if this is, you know, cultural appropriate to say, but when I look at John Stockton, he's like this skinny white guy. <laughs> Wait, he looks <laughs> like he should be an accountant. <laughs> yeah, right. he does. I, I'm a little shocked. Yeah. Right? <laughs> he was not just great. I'm surprised he ever made a team, yeah, <laughs> right? When you look at it, for him, sure. He, he, Absolutely. I was he listening to an, <laughs> an interview with Baron Davis. Yeah. Who, who did Baron Davis play for? He played for the Clippers, Clippers at one point, right? Yeah, yeah. Hornets. But who was he? It was Hornets. He was like big on, right? Yeah. But he said he's like, I was so surprised the first time I put against John Stockton. You just think he's this little white guy, but this guy big. <laughs> he was like, he actually has muscle. He's like, he said he, he compared him like Steph Curry. He's like, mm. he looks little on the screen, mm. but when you come to him, you're like, he's bigger than you think. Yeah, he's still smaller than the rest of them. But the but, Jazz yeah. had another white guy named Hornacek. Mm-hmm. Hornacek. Yeah. yeah, and he was actually a really yeah, great incredible player. shooter. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's it is a little um, surprising. I'm just gonna say that. Yeah, you, you know, and um, but anyway, back to this. I think that what. The All-Star game may actually be an indicator of is what's happening to people across the country, maybe across mm. the world, where our ceiling of expectation of ourselves it just keeps getting lowered and lowered and lowered. Mm. And I find a lot of the cultural conversation is it's okay. You don't need to expect much, much from yourself. Right. I mean, I've been reading articles over the last few weeks about uh, why it's okay to be lazy. Mm why it's okay to be lethargic, why it's okay to underachieve, why it's okay to uh, be unambitious. And and it, it it seems that we have a new cultural conversation about um, why it's okay for us to have a culture of underachievement. Yeah, I don't know. Sure. You interact with so many people. People may not know this, but you, you, you oversee the community aspect of Mosaic. And so you and your wife, Beck, probably have more conversations with people than anyone combined 
when they're in crisis. Mm, yeah, right. And or do just you, in general. Uh, just in general, too. But I, I, we tend to get <laughs> yeah. everyone in crisis, too. <laughs> and, and, we love it. Yeah. And have you found that that there's like a language of apathy or, or lethargy? Yes. Yeah, 100%. A huge aspect of our role the last few months has, has been having these conversations with people. And, and in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of whether you lost your job, your relationship is on the rocks. Like so many people are in crisis and the overwhelming narrative has been, I'm just trying to make it one day, one more day. I'm just trying to survive. I'm, I'm not actually trying to like have conversations that are going to move me forward. They're going to inspire creativity <laughs> or uniqueness or passion. They're like, like I just want to like <laughs> keep my head above water. And I, and I feel like it's a really dangerous place right now mm. because this is a time in history where we need, to elevate yeah. like we need actually to mm -hmm. bring our best selves we need to like fight for the more and fight for mm -hmm. the highest level of living and and we are just dealing with a i think a relational crisis across the world yeah. where yeah we've i've had a conversation with people in south africa and somebody in france um wow. somebody in new zealand and overwhelmingly overwhelmingly people are saying um i don't know if I, how i'm gonna make it through this crisis mm -hmm. and and it's like it, it's heavy it's really heavy and, and people are in feeling so isolated. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been so huge for us as a community trying to, and with Mosaic House is starting, I'm so mm -hmm. excited that people are wanting to connect to something that's bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why what we're doing is so important because we're reminding people that we're always going to be stronger together. That's so good. Now, Aaron, a lot of your friends who are single and you have a lot of friends in their twenties and thirties mm -hmm. and, um, and some of them, are followers of Christ and some of them are not, mm. but they seem to be in the more ambitious kind of category. Right. Some. Some of them. And yeah. you know, I was going to ask you, maybe I, I made an assumption. I was going to ask yes. you, what are you seeing um, among like singles and, and uh, young, uh, you know, I don't want to use the phrase, but millennials, you know, people yeah. in their 20s and 30s. Yeah. Well, what's the what's the age group? It doesn't matter, but I just yeah. I don't like the term millennials. Me either. That's why I like. Know, don't put me in a box, <laughs> generational box. Um, <laughs> Let me live. With people, yeah, I always find it interesting though, because like always with with um with those generational assumptions, they're mm -hmm. always talking trash about the generation that comes next. Like yeah. no matter what, mm -hmm. like the next generation is the worst generation. Yeah. And I'm like no, maybe. I don't know. Maybe if the generation before us was so good, they wouldn't talk about us. Um, <laughs> but they seem to be bored. Except in positive ways. Or just not at all. If you don't have anything good to say, don't talk. <laughs> um, but be more, interesting in, more interested in other things. Uh, young people being ambitious. I do think it's it's an interesting time. It feels like the world kind of went, like especially in the, in the West Coast, I feel like everyone just hit like, bo like was it bobble? Is that what it's called? Boggle? <laughs> what's the what's the old game where you just like press it and all the letters would jumble? Boggle. 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 Like so yeah. many. I was talking to, to yeah. Lawrence Fudge. Yeah the law up in Seattle this morning before we started this. And he was talking about how many kids have moved to LA from Seattle and mm -hmm. how many kids mm -hmm. from LA have gone back home or mm -hmm. how many people have just moved to like where they were from or sure. to Austin or to tech, to Dallas or different parts of the world, not different parts of the world, but different parts of the country just mm -hmm. because circumstance. Yeah. They can go live somewhere for free. They can go spend time with their family. They can work from home. So many advantages in like a unique situation, unique situation being COVID. And now people are going, okay, like, I could never do this again. You right. know, I have a job and they don't want me to come in. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take advantage of being able to work for my family's house and spend time with people or X, Y, Z. We've had the privilege of being really busy during all of this, yeah. where I feel like a lot of people have struggled with busyness or they're busy at with work and then they have nothing to do afterwards. Yeah. So where they would fill their time with serving and being a part of church or like, or just being with other creatives or being with other business people. Well, one, a lot of business people, a lot of friends who are really ambitious don't, there's a common denominator. I don't think they're very interested in COVID, hmm. <laughs> right? They're like, okay, like with the business risks that well, they I take. I like this. This is good. Yeah. So go on and break it down. The, the, ones who are, the ones who are maybe still ambitious in the middle of this and the ones who seem to be overwhelmed with uh, lethargy. Yes. It, I, I wouldn't, I would like, I don't want to criticize their work ethic because right. I think there is still a desire to work hard, but mm -hmm. there's like, there, there may be a, um, 
kind of stuck yeah. in this lethargy or mm-hmm. of fear, right? I, I yeah. don't think it's, I, like, I really want to give them the benefit of the doubt because I think there's a lot of people who are really afraid, mm-hmm. you know, and so they don't work, they're not working as much because, or in, in or doing extra work that mm-hmm. they would normally do because they're so nervous about affecting, you know, people's health and X, Y, Z or their own. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and there's, yeah, there's a tyranny of fear. And then my yeah. friends who are the most ambitious. Yeah just do it anyways and some of them have got it some of them haven't and the people who have are good now yeah <laughs> you know what i mean like maybe not all the way mentally because i think people were treated like the the like the leper sure you know what i mean yeah and i, I think it's similar to maybe we were i was talking to some friends we didn't do a podcast on friday which is why we're doing one now we missed it we were out in the desert shooting some stuff for mosaic and we were talking when we were back we we're like covid was kind of treated how the aids crisis was I felt like mm. maybe back in the 70s and 80s, not comparing that it's the same, but just this fear thing of yeah. like, I remember growing up as a kid in school mm-hmm. being like, AIDS is going to come and find you and kill you. Sure. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And then it felt like this with COVID. And I was like, it made it sound like people were dying in the streets. Right. Mm-hmm. It, not that saying that it, people weren't dying, but it made it sound like it was a zombie apocalypse. Yep. Yeah. And so I think people who were able to like take reality as it was and go outside and go, okay, it's bad, but it's not. If anything, our mm-hmm. culture was more in an uproar than COVID was, sure. if that makes yeah. sense. Like, there were so many important things that have happened in the last year. Mm. I think it had a bigger or greater effect on people who live with the illusion of safety. Mm. Yeah. And if you live your life without an illusion of safety, that you could die any day, that there's all kinds of things that could actually kill you. I think that's the title of this podcast, The mm. Illusion of Safety. Yeah. Let's, that let's log COVID back. had very, very little effect on you psychologically. Mm. Yeah. But if you live with this illusion of safety and all of a sudden now it's it's been violated because COVID has no prejudice. Yeah. Now, well, actually it does. Mm. Well, that's, so there's an irony. We discover COVID does have a prejudice. Mm. It prefers Latinos and Black Americans. It prefers people who struggle with obesity. Mm. It, it prefers people who struggle with diabetes and, 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 uh, and other, um, you know, preconditions, tr- preconditions, yeah. right. You know? And so, uh, if you match the scenario of preconditions, it, it prefers the elderly yep. and the vulnerable, then you have, I think, a legitimate reason to be afraid mm. because those preconditions basically elevate the chances of you being even terminally affected by COVID. But for most people, even if you contracted COVID, it it didn't have that kind of effect or even that possibility. Mm. And so then I think that's where the intersection of people who live in the illusion of security are more more affected because they're so afraid. Yeah, that's that's amazing. It's so true. And I was listening to this podcast recently where this researcher was talking about like how we missed so much of the mark with the way we talked about COVID and the mm-hmm. dangers. And, mm-hmm. and and he was coming from a place of we should have never shut down the schools. Yeah. If there's no data that has shown that kids were at risk, they don't transmit it, they don't, you know, they're not the part of a vulnerable population. In fact, all the data showed that schools were the safest place for kids to be. Yeah. yeah. And and then, the, yeah, the illusion of safety is like, let's mm-hmm. protect all of our kids because there are kids. I'm, I'm a dad of three kids. Yeah. I get that. But there's nothing actually behind the reality that our kids are in danger. And I feel like that's such a great insight. And I think that's a one of the biggest aspects of this pandemic is that we have created a fear, a culture that's obsessed with fear mm-hmm. and is afraid to live. It's afraid to be ambitious. It's afraid to like yeah. mm-hmm. pursue yeah. the dreams that you have because you're like, I got to protect my grandma who could be like at danger and at risk. And, mm-hmm. and it's going to be a generational effect that we see with our kids. You you have three boys. I do. You're married to Beck. I'm married to Rebecca. Yep. That's and my boo. You have three boys. Why don't you introduce why don't you say hi to all your boys? Zai, Indy, River. Daddy loves you. You better <laughs> listen to mommy. <laughs> How old are your boys? So our oldest is Zaya is six. Uh Indigo is four. And then River is a year and a half. Now come you don't have a Joe. You really hijacked me on there, huh? Sorry, on that ahead. thing. <laughs> keep going, keep going, keep going. How come you don't have a Joe? <laughs> no, because his Cause, sister, his aunt's dating married somebody else. 
<laughs> but I did want to have a little bit of homage. So River's middle name is Joseph. And okay. so Ooh, I love that. Um, River Joseph. Yeah. That sounds very Mormon. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to stay on brand. <laughs> He'll be leading our Salt Lake City campus in, in the next five years. I mean, if you're listening, you're Mormon. We're so excited that you're joined that you're with us, that you we join are. us, and that you're part of the Valor Ready community. Yeah. yeah. We love, I did, I've done weddings with a lot of Mormons and they love me because I imagine just my name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how, do you feel like you were asking questions? Do you want to ask questions? No, I'm just yeah. asking about his family. Oh no, I was going to ask, do you feel, do you feel like you, your boys, are they in school now? So Zai is in school. Our Zai's in school. Yeah, he's in okay. kindergarten. So ki in kindergarten now. Yeah. So ha how was it for the last year with them? Yeah, how like long for has he been in school and how long was he out of school? Yeah. You know? You survived <laughs> three sure. boys under the age of seven. I mean, more, marriage, okay. <laughs> my yeah, uh, my wife. Uh, she is a superhero. <laughs> she is God's greatest gift to me, and yeah, it was insane for parents that had to deal with that. Yeah, our, I can't even begin to articulate how difficult it is to try and work from home, to uh, have homeschooling with your kids, and then other kids running around like. Yeah, every day was World War Three in our house. Like, yeah, um, us fighting each other, our kids, and but more so, I was I was really nervous and afraid with Zai of the social like ramifications of of not actually engaging with kids his age. Yeah, mm. because he was in a preschool and then COVID hit, so he got pulled out. So pretty much from that point until they went back to school about a month ago, he has during this formative time where you're meeting kids on the playground where you're learning how to be a friend. I had a conversation the first day of school driving him there and he's asking me, hey, daddy, how do I know if someone is my friend? Like, what do I do? Do I ask them, hey, can you be my friend? If I play with them, does that make them my friend? If I eat lunch, like he, he has no real social skills. Yeah. <laughs> but you can't blame the kid. He learned some of that from dad probably. I'm working on social Damn. skills. <laughs> But he's asking that just recently. Yes, oh, a month wow. ago. Okay, so oh, just wow. chronology. All right, everything shut down around March. Was it last year? 2020. March of last year. Yeah. yeah. March 16th. We're almost on our one year anniversary. Second week of March. Yes. We're almost at the one year anniversary of the end. Times. So your boys Kidding. haven't had outside social interaction in that way in probably 11 months. Correct. When they yeah. went back to school. Yep. Absolutely. So in a school setting, because they still saw friends, maybe or no? Yeah, they still saw some. We have close friends that mm -hmm. yeah. we we would hang out with, yeah. and we would still see over the year. But going to but, a school is different because you're learning how to socialize with people that are not in your natural absolutely circle. You're learning how to uh, how to relate to strangers. Yep. You're learning how to interact with people different than you. Yeah. And you're learning emotional intelligence and relational intelligence. And really, every question he's asking are are about emotional and relational intelligence. Mm. And so what did you tell him? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I told him, one, I, I said, hey, buddy, because he's nervous and he's insecure. And, Am I interesting? And I, and I said, uh, I said, you I'm are. I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> and I told him, hey, buddy, you're like one of the most fascinating people on the entire planet. You have so much uniqueness. Kids are going to die to be your friend. And I, I said, you just be you. Uh, you, you, be, you be kind. Um, be generous with your, you know, and, and that you're going to naturally know what it means to be a friend because you've lived i've seen it with your brothers yeah. uh and so and he's such a kind and loving kid yeah uh he just hasn't had the practice of how to engage <laughs> with other humans and and it's so and it's boring. so like and he's so talkative he's like, extremely talkative as an adult he came over he was at the office i think after school one of the days last couple weeks ago He's so funny to be around. Yeah. He's such a good big brother too. He was like with um he was Indy. Yep. And they're like watching us in one of the offices and he's like he's explaining to Indy what's going on. For sure. And like the whole thing is really funny. And, yeah, he's a sponge. He's and he sponge. soaks it all up and he soaks it in. Yeah. But he has just been desperate to actually be around other kids. Yeah. And Jeez. and this I can't explain how even in the last month how he has thrived. And I see the difference between uh, his development mm -hmm. and, and social skills and his brother, Indy, mm -hmm. who's not in school, who's at home and around mom and his nanny, and they're incredible, but he has not developed the same school social, social skills as I has mm -hmm. just being around kids for the last month. Mm -hmm. And, and this is, yeah, it's the same thing goes with adults, right? Where I'm having all these conversations <laughs> yeah. with people that are like, I am like rotting away in isolation. Mm. And I'm I'm losing the essence of myself because 
they know. They know that they cannot thrive um, simply living for themselves. Mm. And and I'm just nervous for us as humanity that, you know, the longer this goes that and that we fight for this like fear culture and reminding people you got to be afraid and don't go outside and don't talk to this person. Don't meet or be it's like safe, safe, safe. But that's not a way to live. It's it's kind of an interesting dynamic in that. And I want to go here too deeply, but um, we're creating a xenophobic culture. Mm. And because we're afraid to be around each other. But at the same time, we're talking about opening up our borders and letting in hundreds of thousands of migrants. Yeah. And we don't realize that we're actually creating a culture that violates trust in people. Hmm. And, and so we can't expect us to be non-xenophobic and xenophobic at yeah. the same time. Wow. So it's almost like we're supposed to be xenophobic with the people who shop at the same store and get coffee in the same place. And then we're supposed to be non-xenophobic with people who are coming from other countries. Mm. And I'm an immigrant, so I'm saying that. that sure, sure. I don't think we're paying attention to the culture of xenophobia that we've been creating. That's Make, good. We're sending mixed messages. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the stronger message you're saying is be afraid of people. Yeah. And then we're saying, oh, but let's, you know, not be afraid of people who are coming in. And I'm going, you're telling us to be afraid of everyone. Right. Don't, you don't realize you're saying this, yeah. but so you're creating true. a culture where wow. we don't trust the outsider. Jeez. So you, I'm going to put you on the spot. Yeah, please. You're a black man. Yep. You have three boys who um, are going to face the world as black men. Yeah. And so uh, percentage-wise, you're more... Um, inclined to have a negative experience with COVID. Mm. Do you think it has been more dangerous for your boys to possibly contract COVID? Do you think it's more, been more dangerous for them to be socially isolated and disconnected mm. from other children their age? Yeah. Because you have to make decisions based on real tensions sure. in life. Yeah. That's such a great question. And for me, without question, uh, I'm more nervous and I'm more worried about them not being around kids their age and developing uh, just the skills, not just social skills and interpersonal, but also uh, I am fascinated. I love people. Uh, and I love people who are different than me. I've always been drawn to people that have different stories. My wife is from New Zealand. I, and you're from Canada. And I was born in Canada. I know you like to remind I'm, I don't claim that I'm from there. You still have Canadian uh, citizenship? To all, of our, no, to all of our Canadian listeners, we love you. So and we, we have a guest here for you today. <laughs> But yes, I, I was born in Canada. My mom. Where were you born in Canada? Nova Scotia. Nova wow. Scotia. That's like Far real Canada. Far East Coast. Yeah. Far East wow. Coast. Yeah. Is okay. that like Anna Green Gables distance? Kind of. I don't know uh, enough what? about Anna Green Gables. Where's yeah. she at? Yeah. Anna, uh, no. Anna, Anna, Anna with an E. Or, is yeah, that yeah, Anna, Anna, Anna yeah. with an E. Yeah. Tess, look up where Anna Green Gables from. Okay. I, I think you're right on that. Yeah. I think, you know, Nova so Scotia. You're from Nova Scotia. How yeah. long did you live? Oh, was it because your dad was in the army? Well, my mom was from Nova Scotia. Your mom's from Nova Scotia. And so he was stationed at a base in Maine, which is like mm. right Across you know, the, next door. Your yeah. dad was in the military? Yeah, I was in the Air Force, yeah. Wow. 24 years. Yeah. yeah. You must be so proud of him. Ah, uh, so proud. Yeah, he's the greatest man I've ever known. I hit his yeah. car one time in the parking lot. <laughs> did you? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry, Papa Smith. No, I'm right. so sorry. <laughs> he forgives easily. <laughs> I've destroyed so many of his cars growing up. <laughs> Legit. Like I wrecked all every vehicle we ever You're had. a bad driver, huh? Yeah. Uh, we're working on it. <laughs> um what, what were we okay, so Nova Scotia. Yes, yeah, so, so your dad was stationed in Maine. And so we met my mom uh at a bar. They hung out and then fell in love. And, your and dad so, met your mom at a bar. He did. I just yeah. wanted to pause there for a moment. Yeah, okay. met, right. met her at a bar. Right. It explains to me why you were named after your aunt's boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. For sure. <laughs> Don't get high and mighty. You <laughs> met mom at, at seminary, at grad school. But it's cool. just give Rocky Smith a quick shout out. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they did meet at a bar. Rocky Smith. That's, that's my that's pops. The best um, that's awesome. Was an alcoholic. Oh. And my mom got pregnant. Mm -hmm. And he said, I have to become a better man. Wow. Like I've got, now I've got a person who's dependent on me. Wow. So he wasn't there for my birth, which is why I'm Joseph Smith, you know, not Rocky Smith, <laughs> because he was in rehab. Mm -hmm. And he got out of rehab, and he's never taken a sip of alcohol since. Wow. Uh, before you were born, your father loved you more than his addiction. Mm. That's so cool. Dang, Bro. You make me cry. I'm about ready. Bro, I'm yeah. going to cry. Yeah. That's beautiful. Wow. But yeah, it was so beautiful. Yeah, because it's, 
He's like, I, I couldn't be there for your birth, but I want to make sure I was there for your life. And then, shout out to everyone who ever struggled with drug or alcohol addiction. And you paid the hard price of going through rehab and getting clean yeah. for mm -hmm. the sake of your, your family. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. That's so, awesome. It's beautiful. So timeline though. Yes. So he was getting healthy while yep. your mom was having you. Right. But was he, how long were they apart? So it's a love story right here. I know, right? I love uh, your dad, I, by the I way. I think it was a month or so after I was born. Then he got out of rehab. Okay. Because it was also his last strike with, because he was in the Air Force. Mm. And he, they were going to kick him out because he was getting DUIs and all that stuff. Uh, okay. Uh, and so so then when he went back into the Air Force, we lived in Maine uh, for two okay. years. Okay, cool. Then Germany for five years. Uh, we're talking earlier. you used to speak German. I was fluent in German. Mm. Uh and now only only German I know is Nowitzki. Nowitzki. Uh, Dirk Nowitzki. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, wait, so how long okay, and then how long much longer was he in the Air Force? So yeah, he retired nineteen ninety seven. So he was in the Air Force for twenty four years. Okay, so then after Germany, where'd you go? Then we went to Arizona. Then Arizona. And so then where... that's where I grew up. I okay. lived in Arizona. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I don't love the desert. Uh <laughs> As soon as when I turned 18, I said, get me out of here. <laughs> I, spent a, I spent two days in the desert last week, and I ain't never going back. Right? The desert is so confused because it's crazy hot crazy during the day hot. and then freezing cold at night. I'm like, pick one. Pick mm. one. Like, decide, you know. But again, shout out to all our people in the desert, hey. Arizona, New Mexico. We love you. Desert but, warriors. Yeah, so I, I grew up a, a desert boy. All right, so as he's telling the story, just want to know, any, any, any details on Anna Green Gables? Prince Edward Island. Yeah, she's from Where is that? Prince Edward's Island. Is that Nova Scotia? Uh, I think it's close. My mom talks about close. Prince Edward Prince Island. Prince Edward Island. Island. We have a fill-in right? yeah. fill for Brooke and Brian. We got Austin and Tess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And let me tell you, we love them, but they're not researchers. Right. Yeah, they're, they're, they're not coming through at this particular moment. <laughs> okay. All right. Austin, check your phone. And... Uh, I think Gesundheit is actually a German word. Gesundheit, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nine. That's all I got. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, okay. So we're here talking about mm -hmm. the illusion of safety, right? Yeah. So, okay. You're, yeah. Have you ever downloaded the Citizen app? I, I had it thing? briefly, and then when I changed phones, I couldn't get it back on. Probably but, a good but thing. But my wife, Kim, is addicted to Citizen. Yeah. yeah. And every night... She loves the... She's day. keeping me awake, pretty much. <laughs> right. Letting me know there's there's a crime happening 20 feet from our house sure. or or well, two blocks from the house. Or, we, we kind of yeah. live on... We kind of we all we live in all different parts of the city, but mm -hmm. we live on like this the different ends of like a of West Hollywood, Hollywood, that area. And But I'm walking is, distance from high crime i don't know if you are right, right. now i mean there was like a we, we lived in the epicenter of in high the epicenter crime, of high crime. for a long were, time bro yeah. i made you move you did yeah we we had a guy break into our house we had a, somebody <sighs> try to set our house on fire oh, he I had a homeless that. guy took over your house uh -huh. yeah yeah he took over the house yeah he broke in yeah no yeah i, I talked about it you know at mosaic one time literally you should listen to that message oh, wait, 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 broke no. in uh, and they came, and then came back the next night keys, right? to try to steal our car. I remember, yeah, because I came over your house not long after, yep. And you like showed me where, because you moved like the dumpster yeah. in front of your car, front so you couldn't steal it. Yeah, I, I was a criminal justice major. Maybe wanted to be a, you know, a PI for one season of my life. And so that night, yeah, this guy comes in, you know, steals uh, our keys, and and then ran off. Uh, and so when he came back the next night, we're like. We don't have any way to keep him from stealing our car. So I said, let's put the dumpster in front of our car. So if he comes, we could hear the... He's <sighs> moving everything. And like four in the morning, Damn. lo and behold, he came. But you kind of ran out there in what, your boxers or something? I did. I was going to leave that part of the story I out. Remember, <laughs> you gave this talk a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I came out with boxers and a dad bot. Like, that was my... <laughs> you didn't have shirt on. No All shirt on. Because, yeah. bro, you without a shirt on is less intimidating. Wait, but what, 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 did, what did he... What did, he said something funny to you, didn't he? Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I think we, I said something funny to him. So I ran... Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> Tell us, please. What Joe Smith, defending his family, defending his property, uh, defending his honor, did said you have this shoes guy on? his did you car. Have shoes on? No shoes. No Just shoes. boxers. What were you going to do with no shoes on? <laughs> and... No contacts, no glasses, so I'm blind. And I, I ran out, and I may not. You can't see not, without your glasses. I cannot see without my so glasses. They're out there without your glasses. Let you him tell it. Let him tell it. Leave him alone. And John, <laughs> shout out John Thomas Benson, who's on on the team, and like my little brother, he was living with us at, at, at the time. So we both run out there. So he's my eyes, because I can't see, but John Thomas can. 
<laughs> and so I'm, just, I'm like yelling out into the wind, and John Thomas is like, he's over there. <laughs> and my opening line to this guy who broke into our house, stole our keys, put my family at risk, was I just screamed, give me back my keys. <laughs> I was just very literal, and I just wanted my keys back. And, and yeah, he be, he began to describe how he was there to return the keys. And he wasn't trying to steal the car, even though the door was open and the dumpster was moved. And, Dang. and yeah, me and John Thomas had a little conversation between the three of us that will be private. <laughs> yeah, good. And he he left the premises. Very now, now, did John Thomas have enough time to put his shirt on? He did. Well, this because if he was shirtless, then that would be intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a really cool part of the story and why I love John Thomas. Because I go out there, right? No shirt, just boxers. But John Thomas is fully dressed. <laughs> fully dressed. You're ready to go. Shoes. Like, I'm like, Dude, how'd you get dressed? Because it all happened in the matter of like 30 seconds. How'd you get dressed? And he said, uh, I went to bed fully clothed. And my light was on. Because I said, if he comes back, I want to be ready. Dang. And so the moment mm, I yelled, wow. or my wife yelled, actually, he's here. John Thomas jumped out of bed, rushed wow. outside, and he was already ready. I was not prepared, but my boy John Thomas was. So you're saying John you Thomas and John Thomas amazing. standing on the street were a contrast of life stories. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love John Thomas. So if you're listening John right Thomas now, you have to amazing. decide, but you want to be the guy in the boxers who can't see or the guy who's already ready, mm. fully dressed, ready for the challenge. That's a word. <laughs> oh, we, That's good. This is yeah. something interesting too, because I, we were in the desert this last week, mm -hmm. and that's why we didn't get a podcast done. We were shooting for Easter and Good Friday mm -hmm. and all the things that, that Mosaic's doing in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And and one of our call times, we went to sleep. We got back to the house, the Airbnb. I don't like the desert because weird things happen in the desert. <laughs> yes. Anything that happens in a movie, like all these crazy <laughs> movies, happens in the desert. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And we watched some movie with, was it Denzel? Uh -huh. Recently, Denzel, Rami Malik, yeah. and the little things. Jerry oh, yeah, 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 no. yeah. Well, little bad things happen in the <laughs> desert. That's what I learned from that movie. So, we, me and Mariah were driving to to our Airbnb, and because the Airbnbs were small, like we had so many people out there, we 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 had to get different ones. So ours mm. happened to be twenty minutes away from where we were shooting. So we're driving back at like eleven thirty. We've been up since you know not that early, but we've been loading in at eight. We've been setting up. It's freezing outside. Mm. Get back to the Airbnb, and it is pitch black. Mm. Like it's like it's it's so dark that the stars are the only light. And we get this Airbnb. And it's like up in this hill. We can't see anything, and we're going off dirt road to dirt road to dirt road. And the, there's no Wi-Fi. Right. So if something happens, we're on our own. Mm -hmm. And if the, if you know any of those movies happen when there's no wi there's no Wi Fi there's no cell phone <laughs> yeah. connection and then you're with you know your younger sister and you gotta protect her something bad's gonna happen to me that's all mm. nothing's happened to her something's gonna happen to me <laughs> I go first <laughs> and we get into the house and I was so nervous of like her safety and also of not waking up when the alarm went because it was we got in I got to sleep at eleven or twelve o'clock and then or supposed to go to sleep at twelve o'clock and then the wake up was two thirty. I was like, there's no way I'm going to sleep. So I just went, I went into the bed fully clothed. Mm, yeah. With the only thing that wasn't, I had my puffer jacket on. <laughs> <laughs> I just let, I took a shower and put all my clothes right back on. I was like, I'm going to be ready to go the moment we leave. But there is something about fear and readiness. Yeah. I don't know about that story. And Tess, tell me if you think I'm right. What? With the bandana, with the hat right what? now. It reminds me of the guy from Scooby-Doo. Scooby Doo, <laughs> are you really doing that to me publicly right now? Yeah, not, 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 not the goofy one, but the, the guy who was like the, the goofy yeah, one. The cool, you're talking about Fred. Guy, you don't know? do that to me. Uh, don't don't you're, that. you're chasing ghosts. <laughs> chasing ghosts. I was afraid. There was some weird stuff, and like it, the best part was like Matt came up to me the next day, like Matt Pagan, and he was in a different house, but only seven minutes away. And he said, he's like, I mean, we're in the desert. And there's like a weird culture in the desert of like witchy, like yeah, yeah. crystals and like tarot cards and like yeah. all this stuff, you know? Those are all my friends. Yeah. All, yeah, all you, there is, right? There is a thing, right? For sure, yeah. And like some people just think go out to the desert and do weird things. Yeah, and so do. he hits me up, like he comes in up next to me the next day and he's like, hey, like, is there like weird stuff in your in your house? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't know, but I felt weird in my house. That's right. for sure. He's like, bro, there was like a witch book on our house, like how to be a witch like in our Jeez. in our in our house and like tear cards and he's like the first thing I did I'm just starting to pray bro <laughs> right and 
And it was just funny because it was like, it's just funny seeing grown men scared of dark things. Yep. But it's a real, how do you stay ready in a time where it's so easy to be afraid? Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. Is, is sometimes, because sometimes I'm like, I, I feel like I'm attuned to spiritual things that when it's heavy or dark. But then also sometimes I think I freak myself out because we were fine the whole time. Mm. We were safe or relatively safe. Mm-hmm. But there was this illusion of either danger or safety. And then, you know, living in L.A. and, you know, living in L.A., it's a crazy city Mm. that people say is the most dangerous. Like, it's such a dangerous city. And it maybe it's not as dangerous as certain aspects of Chicago or or Dallas or Mm. New York, but it's a pretty heavy city. And there's kind of this we live under this illusion of safety when I'm like, no, you're you're maybe um, unwise if you think it's safe. Mm. Yeah. So how do you face how do you face uh, dangerous situations without having an illusion of safety, a reality of that there are things to be afraid of, but how do you know or how do you handle that? How do you process that now that we've been awakened to the, the fear or the, or the danger yeah, of things? I do sense in our home, I don't know if you'll just with Beck, but Kim is more aware of danger right now. Hmm. And I would say that she, Kim's not a fearful person, mm-hmm. but I would say that she's uh, more concerned or more afraid of what's going on around her, yeah, you know, and and Citizen App, which is kind of where we began, is just it just reinforces her internal narrative that things are really bad. Mm. And if you look at the statistics right now for New York, L.A., Chicago, um, San Francisco, the violence in America is out of control. Yeah, yeah. and if you live in Hollywood um, or this the epicenter of L.A. right now, I mean, it. I, I've we've been through the streets of Johannesburg, yeah, and you know we. I mean, I, I went through Detroit in the middle of its worst season. You lived in South Dallas. I lived in South Dallas it when it was the highest murder, murder rate in the United States. Yeah, Hollywood feels like that, mm. and Hollywood is is in disarray, and you can feel the violence, you can feel the chaos, you can feel the lack of um, civility, mm. and. Um, you know, I, I'm just wondering, has that some, been something that you've been sensing even as you've talked to people and even in your own family? Mm, yeah. The main conversations that we have is, is around fear and it's around what do you do? And I think that's such a great question, you know, Aaron, talking about what do you do when there's not even like the illusion of fear sometimes or, or there's like a perceived it's the reality, it's the of, reality, fear, the reality of, fear. of danger. Oh, wow. think, yeah. 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 And and that's been huge for us because we moved from Hollywood mm-hmm. to some people call it Burbank. I call it North Tulip Lake. Uh, you know, <laughs> just sure. better branding. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> but it's so Hills. much safer. It's yeah. night and little night and day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We leave things out in the yard. We don't have mm-hmm. curtains in our house right now. <laughs> yeah. Like people can and but we're not afraid. Mm. We're not fearful of, of yeah. that. But but we are fearful in terms of like again, your earlier question with our kids, we're fearful uh about the lack of human interaction that they're having even in this neighborhood we've been there for a year can tell you on one hand how many people we've met because no one is afraid to, everyone's afraid to go outside yeah mm-hmm. people don't go on walks anymore people yeah. we say hi and they run to the other side of the street mm-hmm. yeah like even a year we were in talking about that too this week mm-hmm. yeah a year in we still are terrified of each other mm-hmm. right and and i just think we have to uh realize that we are not going to make it if we don't develop the level of courage just to be like be human again this is so yeah. sad wow that's so good you know again. so i'm going to press the question back to you aaron because okay. a lot of times you um always defer and ask the questions that don't, and don't feel like you should answer them okay mm. what would you tell someone right now that was paralyzed with fear i see i have a low impulse control so we've talked about working through that <laughs> and i'm like if i'm gonna die it's gonna happen or not happen and so mm-hmm. i have to just put a bet on like red or black essentially like i've I've just got, like, we're talking roulette. I don't gamble. I don't even do that. It's just, like, me trying to sound cooler than I actually am. I think the reality is that I'm like, okay, if I have a 50-50 chance, I'd rather have a 50% chance of just living a good life until something happens. Mm. And then if I get sick, I'll deal with it then, you know? Mm. And, and I remember, like, I was pretty afraid in the beginning mm-hmm. and not even for 
other people, but just for like my fi- my parents. And mm-hmm. I was like, you were you were cooking for like forty people and inviting everyone over to come through and pick up. You were making like plates for everyone, take it back to your families, because mm-hmm. you love being around people. And I was like, Dad, don't be irresponsible. <laughs> and then I and then I you I think you become I don't know if you become Im- immune to not immune to it but i don't know if you maybe become desensitized to the fear or to the danger mm. yeah because you know like i drive hollywood and la brea every day yeah and then when mm-hmm. we were in the desert when i was like not sleeping that one night citizen app didn't know i was in the desert and thought i was still in hollywood and it was pinging me every like 10 minutes yeah wow. stabbing shooting mm-hmm. yeah. kidnapping screaming assault yeah. blah, blah. someone's breaking into a car and it was just like, I was like, oh, wow. Like, I, I was becoming more attuned to it because I was removed from it. Mm-hmm. When you're in it, you're like, I don't see it. Sure, sure. You know, until you see it. And then it's just like a really bizarre feeling. So I don't know. I don't know how you do. I think you have to just establish a mindset of courage mm-hmm. and of and of connectedness. I feel so much more secure because I know I have people. Mm-hmm. Right? I know, I know that there's people who live a few blocks away or down the street. There's that... And I, that's where I feel for people who maybe don't have a community like like Mosaic, mm-hmm. you know, or like any type of church community where like these people know I exist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. You know, people are check. If people see something going on in my neighborhood on an app, they're checking in. Mm-hmm. Are you OK? What's going on over yeah. by you? Yep. You know, you know, I, I remember getting a phone call from a random person because a gunman had run through the back <laughs> parking lot of Mosaic yeah. and Austin was here with Michael, some of our guys. And. And no one else was. I remember that. And yeah. she called me. It was like, and I didn't even know the numbers. Like, I don't think you have my number, but hey, is, this is your friend from college. <laughs> I live in the apartments behind, and we just saw a gunman with a shotgun running through our yard, or through our apartment, kind of like yard mm-hmm. into your back parking lot. Mm-hmm. Like, can you call everyone and tell them to lock the doors? Wow. And I think actually Kim picked it up on Citizen. Yes. And I called Michael and I said, lock everything down, man. Get yeah. inside. Don't go outside. Don't go. see what's going on. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, my my wisdom to it is one, don't be foolish. It's real. Mm-hmm. But also don't be afraid and live your life in fear. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it is like a tough thing because there are often times where I talk to them, like, how much longer mm-hmm. do we, yeah. how much longer? There's mm-hmm. life. There could just be a more peaceful life. Sure. Mm-hmm. We do something very specific and by doing church on the corner here and 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 in hollywood but there are sacrifices we make Mm -hmm. safety is one of them Mm -hmm. you know and so it is and there are days where you it's more real yeah right and Mm -hmm. i think where it weighs heavier and i often wonder what it would be like to be a part of a church in the suburbs somewhere Mm -hmm. i'd probably not be able to survive that, <laughs> but be like miserable. be miserable. So there's like, a, how do you know, have a little bit of danger? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's such a challenge because um, right now the cultural conversations are, yeah, if you're not afraid, mm. you're irresponsible. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. And, um, and, and there are people who are irresponsible mm. and they may look like people who actually have courage. Right. Wow. But there are people who have courage who are not irresponsible. They're just not afraid. Hmm. And there are people who are responsible, but they're actually not responsible. They're afraid. Hmm. They just, there's, their fear looks like responsibility. Jeez. But there are people who are responsible. And they're not afraid. They're just trying to, to make decisions based on the greater good. Yeah. Right. And I can tell you just even, uh, I get DMs, texts, emails, comments all the time. When is Mosaic opening up? Yeah. And I get them from both ends. I get them from people who, and they seem to be politically aligned, Hmm. who are more to the right, basically condemning me and demeaning me for not opening up and being afraid and, and, uh, and letting the government tell me what to do. And I'm like, sometimes I feel like, you know, how did QAnon become my follower? (laughs) And, uh, (laughs) and, uh, and then I get people on the left who have been angry with me going, you know, why are you responsible? You know, you should sure. be throwing the red flag of fear and, and, uh, and, you know, this COVID is real and all these implications are real and you need to be, you know, fighting the fight of keeping everybody off the streets and mm-hmm. having everybody quarantined. And, and it's, yeah. and, and what's interesting to me is um, whether it's on, on the right or the left of these extremes, they're, um, they're adamant, mm-hmm. like they're absolutely yeah. certain they're right. Yeah. yeah. You know, and 
And so if, if I make a statement like, I'm actually not afraid of COVID, I sound like I'm against science and uneducated. Sure. And in fact, the other day, I had to remind myself I'm actually really educated, <laughs> you know, because... <laughs> List out your, edu- your education <laughs> qualifications, because no. then people forget. You, you, I, I have lots of degrees for a lot of different things. You, you actually know? achieved a level in which they start giving you degrees and naming yeah. schools after you. <laughs> right. And I, I, I've done a lot. Uh, educa- uh, confirm confirm no, or no, deny no, what no, I just no, said. No, because... Is, um, there not a, is there not... You don't want to talk about it? No, I just... I, just, okay. I, I have an education. And no, I have an education. <laughs> you oh, have an edu- you're an you're an educator. <laughs> yeah, but um, I, I, I have the exact. You're turning red. I, I virtually fun. Have, you're turning red. You know, it's funny. I virtually Aww. have the exact same degrees as President Bartlett on West Wing, which you is interesting. Is? He even has the same doctorate that I have. What do you have? And he has a doctorate in humane letters. Oh, wow. and, uh, and I thought this was so interesting. That's Undergrad awesome. from Chapel Hill. Yeah. Ma- grad yeah. degree from some place I can't remember from. But so it's it doesn't great. matter. But my whole point is <laughs> that I don't actually, I've never really played up being educated because I didn't want people to think that the insights that was received from the scriptures were the result of my education, but the mm-hmm. result of the insights that the Spirit of God gives me because I listen to the voice of God. Mm-hmm. And so part of the reason I never really highlighted my education is I didn't want people to go, oh, that's just because you're educated. And I want to say, no, that's because I have an intimate relationship with Jesus. Mm-hmm. But at this point right now, I had to remind myself that I'm educated because sometimes I disagree with what people are saying when they say, well, the science says this, and I'm going, no, that's when I was studying philosophy, mm. and, um, and people started manipulating information and saying, no, well, you know, this is the truth, or this is reality. Yeah. It's the same thing the church did when they would say, well, the Bible says, and so you're not allowed to question anything because the Bible says this. And I go, well, no, the Bible doesn't say that. You say that about the Bible. Sure. And yeah. the same kind of monolithic thinking that existed 100 years ago among Christian theologians saying, well, the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it, yeah. which I'm going, it settles nothing, mm. <laughs> you know, because it's now your opinion is becoming the, the, the basis of reality. People are going, well, you need to trust the science, you need to trust the science, you need to trust the science. And going, there, science isn't a person. Yeah. And you're, you have to decide which scientists you're going to trust. Mm. And scientists keep changing their mind because information changes. So the moment you start acting like science is monolithic, the moment you start mm. acting like science has reached its final conclusion, frankly, you become a fool. Mm, wow. And b- because science it develops over time. There was a time they used leeches because they be- science believed leeches sucking your your, your life out of you yeah. Yeah. was going to heal you from, from cancer or right. heal you from, from pneumonia. And the reality is that science used to believe in electrical shock therapy for mm-hmm. mental illness. And science used to, um, you know... Lobotomize people. Lobotomize people. Yeah. I'm going, if people were not questioning science... Science would not have progressed to where science has progressed. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah. And I'm kind of sick of people going, we well, need to trust the science and going, no, what you're actually saying, we need to trust the monolithic institutions that are giving us singular um, opinions about really complex issues. Mm. And the moment we're not allowed to question the science, we've become an authoritarian dictatorship. Yeah. Wow. Science is just going to become uh, the replacement for what... Um, the Bible was in the Crusades, well, a justification for your opinions and your uh, and your biases. It's so interesting because mm-hmm. because so much of what you fought for in the church space of or the faith space of yeah. of not you or settling for like really Christian language or yeah. your you know the Bible t- God said this to me yeah. and mm-hmm. using kind of like a spiritual manipulation. It is the same thing yeah. with the science group. Yeah, I feel like of, I spent... Well, science yeah. said it. No, well, no, science no. says a lot of things. You don't listen to the other stuff science says. We're not going to go into that today, yeah. but, but you know but what I'm saying? We may one day, yeah. yeah. We and, may one day. Uh, but ah! yeah, for 40 years, I feel like I had to fight against this kind of shallow thinking in Christianity, and yeah. now I feel like I'm having to fight against the shallow thinking in the political and scientific field. Wow. And yeah. it's the same mindset for sure that um, is pervasive. Hmm. And ironically, though, it doesn't mean I'm against some of the conclusions that scientists have given. Mm. And so as, a, as the pastor... Because science evolves, right? It, it, it grows. Yes, so I, everything yeah. does grow. Yeah. Well, all good things and healthy things yeah. grow. Yeah, no, they do. Right. And, and the other day you were watching, uh, we were changing stations and someone, uh, I think it was Fox, that showed like, Fauci changes his mind 10 times. And you basically said, hey, that's unfair because people, people do change their mind. 
based on new information. Yes. And, 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 I defended Fauci. You did. But that's the whole point. Like Fox wants to show you how many times people have changed their minds as if science doesn't change its mind. Yeah, so true. And then CNN and MSNBC wants to posture science as if it's right every single time. Mm. Yeah. Both of those narratives are wrong and destructive and unhealthy. Mm. Mm-hmm. We need to know that scientists get new information and the science changes. And we need to know that every time scientists tell us something, it's not the Magna Carta. Right. It's <laughs> not, you know, it's not scripture. Yeah. It's the vast understanding scientists have in the moment. Mm. But when we're setting global policies and, and affecting the economic stability of nations yep. and affecting the, the emotional, relational health of a generation of children, yeah. uh, we should actually be factoring in a lot more than just one perspective on a crisis. That's so good. Wow. Yeah. I don't have anything else to add. You got anything <laughs> no, else to add? No. Okay, we're gonna let <laughs> that. that we're gonna let sorry. this land. The I don't plane. usually go this far in. No, but it was I just good. Got that a little was upset amazing. about this whole thing. No, it's good. This is really good. But with that, I'm gonna we're land the plane. Is that okay? <laughs> All right. Is that is that okay with you? Or do you have anything else you want to add? No, I just yeah. know if if Pastor Smith had something he wanted to give us as a closing thought. I mean, I think what that... you think, and I I think, <laughs> I think I think I think what you think. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was. Uh, Say more of that yes. for the world to hear. Yes. Yeah, and I think that is your brilliance. You have so many <laughs> layers to your brilliance. But I remember 13 years ago coming to Mosaic and being terrified and full of fear. And it's still a part of <laughs> my internal world. But I remember that day hearing you talk about courage for the first time. Mm. It forever changed my life because um, you helped redefine and reshape the conversation around what it means to be human and our relationship to courage. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the most courageous things that you can do is actually um, press against what everybody thinks and, you know, um, a singular thought process. And, and that's what I'm worried about right now with everything is so concrete and science says this, you have to follow it. Data says this, you have to follow it. Right. Um, Fear, fear, fear. And we're not having this conversation that you're like pushing us to is that actually one of the most courageous things you can do is, is to actually think differently, mm-hmm. to press against the status quo. And uh, just on a personal level, I'm just so thankful for your, like I'm a more courageous human um, because of just my proximity to you. And I think that's what the world needs is, uh, is a redefining of fear is not like the ghost that's going to kill you, but it's actually like, what is going to unleash your most courageous self? Mm. Thanks so much, and it's been a real mm. uh, honor to have you, bro. No, so thank fun. you so much. Yeah, it's been so fun. I yeah, love thanks this. Thanks for joining us. We got to get your kids on to say hello sometime. <laughs> they would love that. They would love it. You have Zai do an intro. Oh, Zai so as you close us out, do we have any merch we're going to release anytime soon? You know what? <laughs> we might as well. Because I have a lot of people asking me, and frankly, I need a new battle ready hat. You have <laughs> some at your house, I think. Um, my battle ready hat list. It, it, it got feet. It got feet. <laughs> it got feet and took away. It oh, went it away. Got escaped. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. We will drop some merch. So by the time you're listening to this, we will, we will. You can look in the link in the bio, um, on the Instagram, and there will be some merch options there. I just want to say thank you to every single person who who um, who supports us on Anchor which is the host of, of this site or of this podcast, and we, we host it on that site. And um, if you listen to this on Spotify or YouTube and you watch it on YouTube or you listen to it on, on Apple um, Music or Apple Podcasts, uh, leave a review on Apple. Go to Apple and leave a review. You can give us five stars. You can say some nice things. You can say thank you to, to Joseph Smith. <laughs> Smith. Two Fs, um, and and um, and just be supportive of of what we're doing. And I just you know, there's a crew of people that that support us financially and and donate each month. And so we're really grateful for them. And mm. we love you. And we will talk to you on Friday. Hopefully, mm. we don't miss an episode anymore. <laughs> I'll be better about that. All right. Okay. Thank you Bye. so much. <laughs>